Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. He's been called the most inspirational data geek you'll ever meet. Today's guest, Marcus Buckingham, is redefining the future of work and challenging our assumptions about organizations, talent, and high performance. After spending nearly two decades as a senior researcher at Gallup, Marcus started his own company in 2006 and now guides the vision of ADP Research Institute as co-head and talent expert. He's appeared on Oprah, been featured in the New York Times, and has companies like Toyota, Facebook, Lululemon, and Disney singing his praises. Marcus is also a best-selling author, and his new book, Nine Lies About Work, is going to forever change the way you think about the world of work. Today, we talk about the myths behind many of our common beliefs about work and leadership, and explore how we can all become free-thinking leaders who value our unique imprint on the world. Let's get right to it. Here's my conversation with Marcus Buckingham. All right, Marcus Buckingham, what a treat to have you on. Thank you so much. We've overlapped at some speaking events, and as we were sharing before we went on, I haven't met you in person, but I've admired your work for years. So thanks for coming on. My pleasure. It's a treat. So, Marcus, take me inside your world at work. What intrigued you about understanding people and performance better? Well, we spend 40% of our life at work. So what intrigues me most, I suppose, about work is that it's an opportunity for you to express yourself and make your dent in the world. Now, there are other places in which you can do that, too, of course, your community life, your family life, and so on. But, But work is a tremendous place for you to discover what it is that you are uniquely gifted at, and then contribute it, refine it, offer it up to the world. Um, so I'm, I'm always interested in, in how we do that and how well we do that. Because, you know, you go to work every day, and yes, of course, it's a transaction. You sell your time and your talent, you get some money, buy things for people you love. But also, it is actually more transformative than that, more potentially uplifting than that. In fact, there are many of us who find work to be a place in which we are given an opportunity to see the best of ourselves. And so if work is that, then it's an amazing place. And if work is not that, it can be an awful place. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that range where there are some people who are clearly elevated by what they do and they are attractive to us and they contribute a lot and they do it in a way that allows them to keep doing it. And there are other people at the other end of the spectrum for whom work is depleting and disorienting, depressing even. Um, so I'm interested in, in that range and frankly, how we get more of the former and less of the latter. <laughs> well, and that, you know, brings me to you were the founder of, of the Strengths Revolution. And can you start really by, by defining strengths and weaknesses, the way that you break it down in, in many of your books and, and a lot of the conversations I've heard you have? Normally, we think of a strength as what you're good at and a weakness as what you're bad at. And by the way, if that is how we define it, then you are not the best judge of your strengths because you're not necessarily the best judge of what you're best at. That's probably going to be somebody else's view on that. It's going to be more apropos, more accurate, perhaps. But that isn't actually a very good definition of strength and weakness because we've all got some things that we're really quite good at that we hate or that bore us or drag us down. And so what, what do you call those things? No, no one listening would go, I don't know what you're talking about. Everyone's got some things where we are capable of doing it, um, might even be really good at doing it, and we never really want to do it again. <laughs> and when we're done with it, we're like, that goodness, that's over. So, so what would you call that? Well, you wouldn't call it a strength and tell someone to build their career around it, because that would be sadistic. We should call that a weakness. A weakness is an activity that weakens you. A weakness is any activity that weakens you, even if you're good at it. If an activity, for whatever reason, it it slows you down or it depletes you or it it somehow 
drags on and on and on. That's a, that's a weakness. A strength is an activity that strengthens you. Mm -hmm. I love how you define it. I think that's so telling because it, to your point, there are things that we love to do that that make us better. And there's things that we don't love to do maybe that the world thinks makes us better, but it's not where we need to spend our time and energy because it doesn't strengthen us. No. And there's, you know, there are telltale signs to a strength. Before you do it, you actively look forward to it. Mm. While you are doing it, it, time seems to speed up and you get into a state that, that psychologists call flow. You think you've been doing it for five minutes, but you look up, it's been an hour. And then when you're done with it, you're not depleted. You might not be quite ready to saddle up and do it again, but you're, you're invigorated. You, when you're, you feel uh, uplifted when you're doing an activity or have just done it. So there are signs, there are very clear signs um, that certain activities, situations, contexts draw some of us in and lift us up. And everyone's different. Everyone has got, like, whatever your strengths are, I, I would have no idea what particular activities strengthen you. And your race and your gender and your age give me no clue. And to confirm that, just look at one's brothers or one's sisters, mm -hmm. where you've got the same upbringing, the same gender, perhaps the same, certainly the same race, um, same basic milieu in which you were brought up. And yet, I mean, I've got an elder brother and a younger sister, and they couldn't be more different in terms of what they're drawn to. Not just what they're capable of, but what, what, they're, what they're drawn to. So, and of course, the beautiful thing about defining a strength that way, Molly, is that, is that um, you're the best judge of your strengths. No one knows what draws you in better than you. No one. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's one of those big misses in, in, in life skills that we don't teach people, and we should. We don't teach children at school how to use the raw material of life to help them identify which particular activities strengthen them and which don't. We should do that, and we don't. I've heard you talk about that. How do you think that could show up? I have three daughters, my husband and I. How do you see that showing up better in our school and in our system for kids? Frankly, I think it wouldn't be that difficult to do. There's a, there's a school system, a big school system in British Columbia that has it's actually a, a few teachers put together a class, a year-long class just on this. Initially, frankly, they were pushing for it because they had uh, some schools with a lot of First Nations kids who were dropping out of school at 13, 14 because they didn't feel as though school had anything to offer them in terms of their future. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they began a class called Your Voice Box. And because they didn't have any funding, they, they just gave every single student a cardboard box at the beginning of the year. And they said, during the course of this year, we're going to teach you to use life to identify what strengths you have so that you can discover your own voice, so that you don't have to acquire or, or, or try on someone else's voice. You can find your own. And so during the course of the year, they did a lot of different activities, simple things like doing, taking a week of your student life and falling in love with a week, which means taking a blank pad around with you, putting love at the top of one column as you draw a line down the middle of your pad and loathe at the top of the other <laughs> column. And then just saying to a kid, hey, look, during the course of this week, just spend a week in love with your life at school. Whenever you find yourself leaning in, whenever you find yourself positively anticipating something, whenever you find time just slides by, scribble it down in the left-hand column, in the love bit column. And anytime you find yourself pushing something off, anytime you find time, just like, put it in the loathe bit column. And then at the end of that week, let's just talk together about what are the activities that you love, what are the activities that you loathe? Can you begin to turn those into definitive statements about who you are and what your voice is. Mm -hmm. And then uh, other weeks they would collect articles, um, mementos, reminders, and put them in their voice box. And so you go to these classrooms and you see at the beginning of the year these, gray, these, so these brown standard cardboard boxes. And then as the year progresses, the outsides get painted and colored and stuff stuck on them. And inside is all the artifacts that a person has lent into. Um, during the year. And it's a beautiful, it's kind of a beautiful metaphor for helping. A, and then truancy rates go down. And so you have basically students using their everyday life at school to begin to identify what their particular strengths are. Mm -hmm. Not just to pat someone on the head, but to then say, okay, now that you know that you've got a unique voice that's independent of your gender or your race or whatever, um, how will you contribute it? And now all of a sudden school becomes useful because it's a way of channeling your voice to the world. 
So now they've had, you know, they've had 15,000 kids go through this program and their outcomes are fantastic. Wow, that's awesome. Isn't that great? And that's, that's awesome. free. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Like, hey, by the way, as you go through your week, do this. Yes. And hi, by the way, as you go through your year, do this. Put it in this box. Yeah. It's so powerful. It's just a very simple way for somebody to inventory and to show someone that, that life speaks to you in a language that only you understand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if we, if we continue to think that learning is just pouring facts into an empty vessel, we're missing the human. Right. We don't see the child. Sure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your book, Nine Lies About Work. You know, what's the biggest message you want readers to take away from the book? Well, at the moment, we have very, very low levels of employee engagement around the world. Mm -hmm. The research institute that I run has just finished this 19-country global study, and somewhere between 155 to 16% of people are fully engaged at work, and everyone else is just coming to work. So we have a crisis in engagement at work, and we have a crisis of per-person productivity. If you look at the per-person productivity numbers in most of the developed countries around the world, we are seeing tiny, tiny growth over the last 40 years. So whatever the management strategies are that we've been deploying, which are probably extensions of F.W. Taylor from the 20s, scientific management, became business process reengineering, total quality management. Now we tend to call it lean. Whatever all those strategies are, they don't work anymore. Work isn't working for us. So what this book presents is a simple, but I hope coherent way to say there is a better way for us to do work. And the simplest way to do it is to engage with the world as it really is. At the moment, we've got ourselves caught up in a whole bunch of theories, a whole bunch of dogma, which we ended up calling lies, that prevent us from seeing the world as it really is, prevent us from seeing ourselves as we really are, pre prevent us from seeing the people on our teams for who they really are. And a lot of these lies are well-intended, well-intended lies. But until you can break those lies apart and reveal the truth behind, we will continue to create workplaces which are deeply disengaging and unproductive. And that's where we are today. So this book is saying, engage with the real world, with real people in it. There's a better way for all of us to do work, whether we are just managing ourselves or whether we're managing a team or a team of teams. So I want to rattle off the nine lies and dig into a few of them in particular that really popped for me. So number one, people care which company they work for. Number two, the best plan wins. Number three, the best companies cascade goals. Lie number four, the best people are well-rounded. Lie number five, people need feedback. Lie number six, people can reliably rate other people. Number seven, people have potential. Number eight, work-life balance matters most. And number nine, leadership is a thing. Those are powerful. Which one of these do you get the most pushback on? I'm just curious. It's two of them, really. The first one is, is people need feedback. I don't know when it happened, but somehow everyone woke up one day and decided that what we are missing most in the world is feedback. And that what we should do is give lots and lots and lots and lots of feedback to people. And then we should teach people how to give it and then teach people how to receive it. And the more critical, the more transparent, the more brutal, the more radically candid our feedback is, apparently, the better. And that if we could just do this, then we would all uh, win. People really have just en masse, just just totally swallowed that one. <laughs> and the other one is people care which company they work for. You know, Fortune Magazine's best-selling issue is the best, 100 best companies to work for issue. We love the idea that there's a thing in a company called the culture. Every company's got a unique one. And if you're not busy building the culture, then you're missing the boat. So you've got to build a culture and you've got to make sure it's coherent and amazing and wonderful. And, and if you do that, then, then you'll be able to build an amazing company because People really, really, really care which company they work for, and they want to work for a company with a great culture. Again, that one is like just, we just say that. That was just so easy for, what's your company culture? Like, it just sounds so beautiful and true. And so you say that people might care which company they join, but they really don't care what company they work for. And and that once they're people really care which team they're on. And and that's what you talk about is that's what that matters to them. And And so why does team matter the most? To puncture that lie, all you have to do is go inside any company that supposedly has one culture and start measuring anything. So this book, by the way, is just, it's founded on data. I mean, the whole book basically says, let's start with what's knowable. Don't start with a theory. Start with what's knowable. So you start to go inside a company, any company, Tesla, uh, Facebook, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, Walgreens, 
Chick-fil-A, wherever you go, even companies that suppose they have a very strong quote unquote culture, you go and start measuring anything like productivity or customer satisfaction or employee engagement or lost work days or voluntary turnover. Things that you would have thought wouldn't vary inside a company, and you find that they vary hugely. Mm -hmm. Department by department, team by team, you find variation, huge variation. Even on a question like, I believe in the company's mission, you find that varies. Two teams in the same department working in the same location, a very simple question about belief and mission, which shouldn't vary if a company has one culture, does vary. Do I clearly know what's expected of me? A question that's a simple question about expectations, huge variation on that one question inside the same company. When you bump into that kind of data, you are forced to go, well, wait a minute. If a company's supposed to have one culture, why are we getting this variation team by team by team by team by team? And you keep pushing on the idea of culture and you can't find it. You can't measure it. It's not there. There's no there there. Now, people do want to pick companies using some criteria, and so we do care which companies tell the best stories about themselves. We like that, and that's why we read the Fortune Best Companies to Work For list, because it's a recruiting manual, and it, it's to attract talent, and that's fine. That's no problem. But that really is a driver of who we join. But once we're there, it's like, why do we care about team? Because that's all there is. There is no culture. Or at least one person's definition or experience of the culture seems to vary hugely in the same company. Another person's the experience other. of the culture, right, working in a, in a team just around the corner. So what we have, what's real, whether we believe it or not, whether we think it's true or not, our team still exists. There are people coming to work every day. Look, there's one and there's another one and, and they're real. Mm -hmm. Whether we believe our culture is a culture of innovation or whether we think we've got a culture of customer focus or whatever we think our culture is, is irrelevant. When we bump into the fact that John and Brian and Marjorie are working over there, and I like that one, and I don't like that one, and I think he's got my back, but I'm not sure about her, and that's real, mm -hmm. whether we believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And so what we have in, in companies is a huge variation in performance and retention, and therefore we have a huge variance in what the experience of work is like, and that variation flows through the lens of team. We just finished this, as I said, this 19 country global study, 83% of people say they do most of their work on a team. Now that means 17% of us, I don't know, we're sitting in a shed all by ourselves at the bottom of the garden, <laughs> but 83% of us are doing some sort of teamwork. And by the way, 63% of people say that they're working on more than one team and that that team isn't reflected in the org chart. So here's a weird thing, right? Here's a super weird thing. We do all of our work stuff, goals, feedback, employee engagement surveys, compensation, succession planning. We do all those things through who reports to who boxes on an org chart. And yet those boxes on the org chart miss the work, the works on teams. We can't see the teams. We can't see the work. No wonder engagement is a mess. No wonder we've got no more increases in purpose or productivity. We can't see the work. All of the initiatives we have inside of companies are deployed through the boxes on the org chart, and the boxes on the org chart isn't where the work's happening. Mm -hmm. It's happening on the team. It's happening on teams, and most of those teams are dynamic or ephemeral teams that come together and break apart. And HR is not the source of truth for which teams exist and who's on them. <laughs> the team leader is. Sure. And by team leader, we just mean anyone who invites a bunch of people to come work together on something, and they all say yes. So teams are an emergent property. Sure. And, and so, you know, we've all heard the saying that people – don't leave companies, they leave managers, right? So would it actually be more accurate based on what you're saying that people don't leave managers, they leave teams? Yeah, I mean, I wrote about that statement back in 1999 when I wrote First Brick All the Rules, you know, where it was like, it, it's the manager, stupid. And it, no question, the manager is really important, but people leave teams. That's what they leave. Yeah, the, the team experience is the defining experience. We called it the sun, the moon, and the stars in the book. And and you've, you know, all of your listeners will have experienced that. You, you work for one team and you feel disengaged. You feel like someone's about to stab you in the back. You don't really know what's expected of you. You can't figure out your role. Work's awful. And then something changes. It, maybe it's a new manager. Maybe it's a new project. Maybe it's a new couple of new team members. And pretty soon it ha can happen quite quickly, can't mm -hmm. it? Like mm -hmm. six sure. weeks goes by. Then you're like, same company. You're, you haven't left the company, but but your t experience of working is totally changed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you love it. So the most important unit of analysis 
for us to understand in companies, our teams. And at the moment, it's so weird. Like take a really great company like, I mean, take Google as an example. They don't know where their work is. They don't know which teams exist, how many of them, who's on them, which are the best ones, how to create more like them. We've just missed the elephant in the room. So let's shift to line number three, right? That the best companies cascade goals. Can you tell our listeners, what do you mean by cascading goals? Many, many companies have decided that one of the things that they want to do is ensure alignment. It's, it's the big fear of any C-suite is that we're not aligned. You'll hear that word if you haven't already and you're in the world of work. All the time. We've got to make sure we're aligned. Because the fear is, of course, that, that we're going to be pulling in different directions from one another and we're not going to be efficient and so forth. And then companies decide that the best way to ensure alignment is through a mechanical go- goal cascading process, whereby the CEO writes his or her goals down, and then the C-suite one level below write their goals as a subset of his or her goals. And then one level below, they get many, many goals. And then below that, many, many, and then many, many, then many, 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 many. And everybody <laughs> just gets many, 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 many versions of the CEO's <laughs> goals. And in a lot of these human capital management software tools, your, your field, your goal field, on which, by the way, you will be evaluated at the end of the year, on which you will be paid at the end of the year. So this isn't esoteric stuff. This is really meaty stuff that just deals with your pay and your likelihood of being promoted. Those are automatically populated. Not every field is automatically populated, but in many companies, your goals will suddenly just appear in a field, in a piece of software, (laughs) as though that is the way in which you align an organization. And there are so many things wrong with that. But the most obvious one is, if people were going to use their goals to align their actions during the course of a busy and dynamic and ever-changing year, if people were using their goals as the alignment mechanism, you'd have thought at some point during the year they would go back in and look at them. Maybe even, I don't know, change them according to the changing realities of the world of work that they're, that they're living in. And we don't. We know less than 5% of people even go back and look at them once. The whole thing is a game of kabuki. It's like shadow puppets. (laughs) And all of this cascaded gold stuff is like Saturday work where we we don't do it. It's not real work. It's something we have to do on Saturday. Oh, go fill out your goals. And so you say the truth is that the best companies cascade meaning because that's what people want. And that's what they want to know and share. Yeah. Alignment is an emergent property that comes from a lot of people running around in the company making decisions and choices. And being responsible for those decisions and choices, from that you get alignment. And so what the best companies do is they cascade meaning. They are rabid about cascading their meaning through stories, through ritual, through heroes, through anything they can to cascade, this is what we value here. If you don't like it, bugger off. Mm -hmm. This is what we value here. Now, by the way, goals that you set, you know, my problem here as we look at the data isn't that goals are bad in and of themselves. It's the cascaded goals from above you are useless. They're useless as a measurement tool. They're useless as an evaluation tool. They're useless as a stimulant for performance. All of those, they don't do any one of those things. That doesn't mean that goals are bad. If you have a value, like if you, if you value physical fitness and, and challenge, and you say to yourself, you know what? I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to go do that then the beautiful thing of that is that is a manifestation of something that you value. You've just made it real for yourself. Are goals useful in that regard? Absolutely. So we now know the only criteria for setting a powerful goal, it doesn't need to be an OKR or a KPI or a BHAG or a SMART goal. All of these sort of definitions of a good goal. The only definition of a good goal is that you set it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if companies want to create alignment. You cascade meaning down through an organization. You cascade what you value. You bring it to life for people. And then they will set their own goals that are in accordance with, right? That's how you get alignment. Alignment is an emergent property. It's not a coerced property. Got it. We're not machines. And we built our cascaded goals as though we're machines. What style negotiator are you? In other words, how do you show up? In our Game Changer Negotiation Training Workshops, we teach the value of what we call 360-degree awareness. We all negotiate differently based on our upbringing, lifestyles, and business background. 
An awareness around our own negotiation style enhances our ability to succeed in any negotiation. To get started, we've created an assessment to help you identify which style negotiator you are. Take the assessment at GameChanger360.com and start your journey to becoming a Game Changer negotiator today. Now back to the show. So how would you sum this up for a leader who's listening that says, okay, well, these are the things I've got to accomplish this year as an organization for me as a leader. These are the things that I need for this organization to move from A to B. How would you advise them to do that? Like in sort of what would be your summary of that? Exactly. What do they go do? There's nothing wrong at all with saying as a company, as a company, our goals are this and this and this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, the whole of Wall Street operates around predictability. So companies themselves can say, this is the hill we are going to take this year. This is how high it is. This is uh, how we're going to measure our progress. There's nothing wrong with saying that at all. So for a company overall to say that is cool. Then, frankly, for each person, the best way for you to manage your team to achieve that goal, whether your company has 50,000 teams or five teams, Mm -hmm. The best way to do that is through a weekly check-in. You have 52 little sprints this year. You're going to have to make sure if you're managing your team, you're going to make sure that sprint number 36 is as focused and as energizing as sprint number one. Mm -hmm. So sprint number one, you're going to sit down with each of your people one-on-one and you're going to stay for 10 or 15 minutes. You're going to say two things. Number one, what do you think your priorities are this week and how can I help? That's all you're going to do. Now there's a big company goal. We talked about it. It's this mountain over here. We're going to climb it. But then let's talk to, when we sit down with you, I'm just going to ask you these two questions every bloody week. What are your priorities this week and how can I help? And then together we'll figure out, are they still those priorities? Have they tweaked? Have they adjusted? And that's a 10 to 15 minute conversation as we make sense of the real world that you're facing together. Now, if in one of those meetings, you, the team member, want to say, well, I have a goal. My goal for this year is X. Okay, that's fine. That's great. Let's talk about that. You know, if we're going to meet every week, Let's revisit that. It's funny. The check-in, the individual check-in, one team leader to one team member, 10, 15 minutes every week. That's what leading is. Mm-hmm. Sure. This isn't in addition to leading. Like right. th- This is what leading is. And it's so odd. We don't do that. We, do, we sort of meet with people once every six months. Okay. Or maybe, right. Right. you know, we'll try and do a, uh, an individual development plan, maybe once every quarter. Mm-hmm. And all of that is just a, a complete waste of time. What we have is people bumping into the real world all the time every week. And what they want is someone to help them with that. And so, Marcus, you know, what comes up for me, for my team, for example, I do a weekly check-in. Every Monday morning, we get on the phone and we check in. You said to do it individually. And, and you also talked about how team is so important, of course, How important is it, though, for a team member to hear what is on the plate or what someone's priorities are for that week for the other team member, right? So for that level of collaboration, how does that show up? Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost counterintuitive that the most important ritual for building team is one-on-one check-ins. But the data on this is unequivocal. Those particular teams where people, yeah, it's almost like you, if you start with team and then try to go narrow, It's not nearly as powerful as starting with each individual, talking to them about what they're doing, what their priorities are, and what their contribution is. It's the raw material for their ability to then contribute it to everyone else. So you would tell a leader to have the one-on-one check-ins, and then if you have a weekly team meeting of some kind, you do that after the check-in. Interesting. Okay, got it. Yes. Cool. And I wouldn't just say this. I mean, this isn't me just... If you run the data and you count the check-ins... And then you count the check-ins that are one-on-one and you count the check-ins that are group conversations of some kind. Um, There is no predictive relationship between the number of or the frequency of team meetings and subsequent productivity and engagement. There's no difference at all. There's There's no relationship. The relationship only starts to exist when you start counting the frequency of one on one check ins between a team leader and a team member and mm. subsequent performance and engagement. Interesting. That doesn't mean team meetings are not important. I'm not sure. suggesting I that. Understand. Getting people together. It's just we've missed the I in team. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a really big I in team, and it's the individual going, What do I bring to this team? Does anyone know? Does anyone pay attention? To the intersection of me and work. That's interesting. So lie number five, people need feedback. And you say the truth is people need attention because we all want to be seen for who we are 
at our best. We talked about feedback briefly. So what should people do instead and why? Well, we tend to believe that feedback, like why are we so fixated on feedback? We're fixated on feedback because we think it's the best way to help a person excel. If you didn't get told by me that your podcast was, was boring and disorganized, then you would never know, and that would be bad. Mm-hmm, but that's not true. Well, of course it's not true, <laughs> right? right? But, but that brings another thing up, which is that I am the source of truth about you. You are deluded about who you are. I, the external observer, I am the source of truth about you. Mm-hmm. So we've got a lot of these kind of core oh, beliefs about feedback, right? That I am, number one, I'm the source of truth about stuff. Number two, if I didn't tell you things, you wouldn't know, and that would be bad. And number three, the best way for you to excel is to me to point out what you are doing wrong so you can repair it or fix it. Mm-hmm. We're very good as external observers. We're very good at pointing out where someone's mucking it up. And we think that that's, that's our duty. And it's what people need. And we also think that's what millennials want. In fact, if you look at the biggest social network that's grown up in the last three years, the millennials have been flocking to, it's Snapchat. Mm-hmm. Snapchat has no feedback on it at all. The very definition of Snapchat is the place where you get attention and no feedback. And kids love it. So we we totally misdiagnose what people really need. We, if you want to help someone excel, yes, pay attention to them. No question. Humans develop best in response to another human. No question. So, so ignoring people is worse than even giving them feedback. To start with, people want attention. But the attention that they want is what I would call coaching attention. Come around, you know, feedback's like a grenade that you throw over the fence and, you know, the other person's in pieces and but you walk away going, well, I gave them the feedback, my job's done. And what they want actually is you to come around onto their side of the fence and look at the world from their vantage point and particularly look at what's working for them. The raw material of anybody's future greatness is their present day goodness. So we need to be much more attentive to each person. Where is it working? And then in terms of an actual tactic, We've got to be able to teach people how to uncover what works. I don't mean praise it or celebrate it. I mean investigate it. If you're a team leader, normally you go through the day and you're just spending a lot of your time going, stop that, oh, stop that, oh, stop that, oh, stop that. And that's okay. If someone's doing something completely wrong, then you've got to tell them to stop that so they get to adequate. That's not bad. It just only gets you to zero. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you want to help each person excel, you've got to look at something else. When you see something that works for them, you're not going to stop that. You go that, that. Hey, did you see that? That, that email. When you wrote that, did you see that was so right. Everybody lent in when you wrote that. Or did you see the customer when you tried to pitch them that? Did you see that's when they leaned in? That's when they leaned in. That's what to go that and then to help someone uncover what works for them is such a gift. What an amazing gift to give someone. It's like with your three girls. It's like you want to go when, let's say they wrote a paper and you, there's a lot that's wrong with it, but you go, and and by the way, yes, if they're missing certain facts or the dates are wrong in a history paper, then obviously that has to be corrected. But what we really want to be helping our kids do is go, oh, that whole paragraph there, that drew me in. Mm. The way that, I don't know how you did that, but that worked. How brilliant would that be for mm-hmm, our mm-hmm, kids mm-hmm, to see, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's cool. So that's what people really need. That's what millennials really need. That's what all of us really need. That. Okay. Yeah, focus on the strengths when you're providing the feedback, except when the facts are off. Well, there's two places where you need feedback, facts and steps. Okay. If you're putting the wrong dosage in a, in a needle to give a patient an injection, somebody right. needs to go, that <laughs> is wrong. Or if there are certain steps for giving a safe injection and you miss one, then absolutely somebody needs to tell you, you missed step three. Got it. But if you want to help someone excel, it's not looking at their strengths. Remember, strengths are what strengthen you. That's the province of the individual. What you're looking for, you're looking for um, activities that work. You're looking for things where the person, whatever it was, Mm -hmm. you're going, hey, listen, I'm not the authority on this man, but I'll tell you what, when you did that, I lent in. I lent in. What was that? It's looking for what works about a person and helping them to refine it, recreate it. I mean, it's an amazing discipline to get into. Sure. If you want to be a good leader. If you don't want to be a good leader, don't listen to any of this. Right. No. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. You know, one of the ones I missed that I want to bring up is, is line number four, which is the best people are well-rounded. And this is interesting to me because when I was a sports agent, 
you know, baseball teams were always looking for five tool guys, right? Guys that hit for power, guys that hit for average. I've seen you talk about soccer players. I've heard you talk about Tiger and sand saves. Tell me a little bit, you know, after reading your book, it sounds like teams looking for five tool guys. Is that a mistake? And and can you dig into that myth a little bit for me about that the best aren't well-rounded? Yeah, if you look at excellence in the real world, if you just look at the most excellent singers, Frank Sinatra, Adele, I don't know, Beyonce, pick your singer, Kanye, um, Ed Sheeran, I don't know. <laughs> um, the, you line them up against the wall, you'd go, wow, they don't seem to have very much in common at all. Uh, you take the very best basketball players. Even you, you take the very best free throw shooters in history. And even though you've narrowed it down to one sport and one activity in that sport, in fact, one very prescribed activity, stand on that line with this ball and throw it in that hoop. If you're shooting above 90% for your career, which very few do, you'd have thought they would all have some sort of secret technique that they all use. But if you line them up, you'd find that they all have a totally different style and technique. They're different heights, they're different ages, they're different races. Some of them do the overhand throw. Some of them throw it. Granny, Rick Barry was the number, the, when, when he retired, he was the most accurate free throw shooter in history when he, on the date that he retired. He threw granny style. <laughs> so if you look at excellence in anything, you find idiosyncrasy. You look at the excellent soccer players, but you also look at excellent leaders. I mean, just look at excellent salespeople. The best salespeople in a company, you study them. They do not all sell the same way. What's interesting is you look at average in anything. Average is homogenous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Average, uh, you know, let's define the average golfer. Okay, well, he's going to stand on this side of the ball and he's going to hold his club like this and he's going to you know, reach back with his right hand and keep his left foot. Okay, well, we, we can define average independent of the person being average. <laughs> but that's all you get. You get average. You can't define excellence independently of the person being excellent, which means talking about what is an excellent soccer player it only starts to make sense if you're talking about Lionel Messi versus Pele, two totally different players who played a totally different style, both amazing. And of course, baseball players, it's the same thing. If you want to define an average baseball player, you could define the five skills that you want to be able to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's very, very rare to find someone. I mean, if you take the best, however you define best, baseball players, they look really, really different. Now, one of them, by the way, one of them might be pretty bloody well-rounded. One of them might be uniquely, weirdly well-rounded. But that person will be an anomaly. Sure. Right. Everybody sure. else is, has unique qualities that they bring. And so what we do in the world of work, and this is everywhere, we sit down and define lists of attributes, sometimes called competencies. Mm -hmm. And these things are called competency models. These are the competencies you're supposed to have if you're going to be in sales. These are the competencies you're supposed to have if you're a supervisor. And the, co the competencies get more complex and more abstract the higher up the company you go. And by the way, for those who are listening, you're going to get rated on these competencies. You're going to get trained on competencies that supposedly you don't have. Mm -hmm. Some of you, if you work for the federal government, you cannot get promoted unless you are measured to have all of the required competencies for a certain job. This is by an act of Congress. Mm -hmm. And all of it is bogus. All of it. There is not a single referee journal anywhere in the world that shows that the best practitioners in any job possess all of the same competencies or attributes, not a single one. And yet that whole thing defines our entire approach to people. The best people in a job have all of these qualities because the best people are well-rounded. And all of our training, all of our remediation with you, all of our succession planning with you will be based upon whether or not you possess all of these competencies. And it's all, it's all made up. It's all rubbish. And it, what it does, of course, is it goes all the way back to the first point you and I were talking about. It means you don't see the individual anymore. All you see is your model. And it's taking the human component out of it. Well, you, you don't even see the human anymore. Yeah, yeah, You've right. got three girls. Those three girls are going to go to work one day. And you hope, against hope, if someone at that job is going to see one of your girls for who she really is. Sure. And to help her to contribute that to the world. Well, the way in which we currently do people, this competency model fetish that we have, 
will prevent your daughter from being seen. For who she really is. For who she really is, right. Mm-hmm. Because somebody, a priori, decided there was a list of attributes that she should have all of. Now, there's no proof that the best do. Somebody just sat down and wrote them out and then created a rating system and then, you know, creating an act of Congress that says that you got to have them. And it's all bogus. I want to touch on one more lie, right? That that leadership is a thing. And, and what you say the truth is, is, is we follow spikes because spikes bring us certainty. That last chapter, leadership is a thing, is kind of an extreme version of chapter four. Remember, chapter four is, is the best people are well-rounded. Mm-hmm. So you take that to its extreme and you build competency models for leaders. And you say, these are the qualities you're supposed to have to be a level five leader, or these are the qualities you're supposed to have to be a servant leader. Um, And we define them, and then we design 360s to rate you on them, and then we say to you, listen, if you want to get better as a leader, you better go and acquire the ones that you don't have. First of all, as I said about competencies in general, there is no proof anywhere that any the best leaders all share the same list of attributes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you get a group of leaders together and you start trying to measure what attributes they have, as a group, they manifest all of them. But it's false logic, obviously, to then say, therefore, any one leader should have all of them, or that you will get better as a leader if you acquire the ones you lack. So right then, we just bump into almost all leadership development is based on this premise that you should have these required attributes, and, and it's all wrong. Instead, The only thing that leaders have in common, the only thing the best leaders have in common is followers. They've got a bunch of followership is a thing. Mm -hmm. We can measure that, actually. We can measure whether or not some leaders have got more people to devote their breath and their life to that leader's vision than another leader. We, We can measure whether somebody's committed themselves to someone else. Followership is a thing. When you then look at the leader through the lens of followers, you realize that what leaders are all about is rallying people to some better future. That's the very definition of a leader, is I've got something around this corner that I think is going to be amazing. And of course, for human beings, our natural response to that is anxiety, because the future's uncertain. Sure, and around the corner is scary. Scary. I mean, and it's not, that isn't stupid. I mean, to be a little deliberative prevented some of our forebears from wandering into dark caves and going, I wonder what animal lives in here. <laughs> you know, so, so being a little, sort of a little cautious is actually quite sensible. The challenge for the leader, of course, is that you can't demean that anxiety and pretend it doesn't exist. You've got to engage with it and you've got to turn it into confidence. That's what leaders do. They take followers' natural anxiety and turn it into confidence. And the way they do that, when you really look at it, the way they do that is by developing some deep mastery in something that is relevant to the followers. We follow spikes because we go, I know, number one, I know that person is so deep in that, that that they have asked the 17th question. It may not be an area that I know much about, but they know an awful lot about something. And and one of those somethings is themselves. They know who they are. And that means as I walk around the corner into this forest of the future, I know how you're going to be. I may not always like it, but I know it. And I follow that because I want certainty in this future. I mean, why did, you know, you can argue about the content of what people are saying. There's many people that don't agree with what Trump is saying, but he is not vague about who he is. And we follow that. We like that because that's a spike. He's very spiky. Martin Luther King, we have a a long description here of what his particular spike was. Very different spike than Malcolm X. Very different spike than Robert Kennedy. I mean, it's not like all of these leaders of the civil rights movement, Ralph Abernathy, these are all really different people committed in this case to civil rights in the 60s. Uh, But the best leaders amongst them, and obviously Martin Luther King was one of those, had very, very clear spikes. And for him, he was a crucible maker. He created flashpoints that forced people to choose. And he would go, as you know, he would go to these flashpoints. And there was no plan. There was no grand strategy. There was just a vision of a more equal world. And then lots of contingent flashpoints to create the intensity needed for change. Now, not every leader does that. John F. Kennedy didn't do that. He did something else. So, but we follow. The best leaders are super spiky. 
And we hook on to those spikes because they give us certainty. I know who that person is. So for every leader you want to grow, you got to know why are people following me? Me, me. What's my spike? Maybe it's two spikes, maybe, but it's not three. Sure. So it's one or two things yeah. that, that, okay, got it. So if it gets much beyond that, we just question your authenticity. We don't know who you are anymore. Got it. Right, 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 right. Sure. Tell me this. What are some of your favorite resources that you'd recommend for our listeners? I love reading myself. Sure. So I'm a big fan of um, any book about human uh, destiny mm-hmm. and human uniqueness. There's a wonderful book called The Soul's Code which I would recommend to anyone who wants to know about the uniqueness of us and, and what, that, what that's all about for us. Um, there's a wonderful book called Sapiens. Yes, I'm looking at it. I have yeah. it. It's awesome. The first chapter is pretty tough, but you get beyond that. It is and it's tough. Just, <laughs> but beyond that, it's really, really, really good. Yeah, yeah. What about technology-wise? Anything there? There are very, very, very few tools for team leaders, if you think about it. Mm-hmm. And so the, the thing that I rely on is a piece of technology that we made. It's called Standout. And it just answers three questions for you as a team leader. Number one, what are the strengths of your people? Number two, what are they working on this week? So there's like a check-in tool mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. enables you, just nudges you. Like nudges are good. So it nudges you every week. Hey, you got seven people, Marcus. Have you spoken to them this week? Mm-hmm. And then the third, the third thing is a, a validated engagement tool. Because the other thing you want to know is what is the mood of the troops? And the person who should get that data right now is a team leader, not HR, not the CEO. All of that once a year employee engagement stuff is totally for the wrong audience. So I use, I rely on that really heavily. It's called Standout, and it is a tool simply to help a team leader get the best out of their team. Got it. And so is that an app? Yeah, it's an app on the phone. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would just type in Standout, and you can, you'll go right to it. <laughs> So we end with rapid fire. So I'm going to fire off some questions and you just fire back your answers. All right. What was your first job? My first job was working in the summer for the Gallup organization when I was 16 in Lincoln, Nebraska. What are you currently reading? Uh, Well, right now I'm actually reading. I've got to write another article for HBR. And so I'm deep into that. Uh Um, So I'm (laughs) reading that article again and again to try and make it better. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) One book that changed your life. It was actually a passage from Scripture. Mm -hmm. I read it out loud in chapel when I was 12. I actually don't remember the exact words I was saying. It was from Corinthians. And I had a stammer when I grew up, and I couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. And it went to, after lots of speech pathology training and so on, I went, I was picked to read aloud in chapel, and I went up to read this piece from Corinthians, and... The stammer went away completely. Just one day it was there, and one day, the next day it was gone. And it was, that completely changed my life. Not Mm -hmm. because of the content of what I was saying necessarily, but because I read and somehow I could speak. And I have to just tell you, I've heard you talk about that. My mom was a speech pathologist, and I found that absolutely fascinating because what you talked about, Marcus, was you got in front of a group of people and you realized that in front of a group of people, you you could speak flawlessly and that the bigger the audience, the better you do now when you speak. Yeah. That is incredibly interesting to, to me personally. It's weird, isn't it? Very interesting. It's like Emily Blunt, the actress. She had a terrible stammer growing up and the only time that she stopped stammering when she was acting. Mm-hmm. Some people, when they start to sing, they stammer when they talk, but they don't when they sing. Yeah. It's a very, I'm sure your mom bumps into this, that the gateways to fluency are as varied as the number of disfluent people out there. And for me, it, it really was the strangest thing to look at all these eyes and find, like I could almost feel it in my, you could almost feel the gateways being opened. I'm sure that all stems into so many of your beliefs about our strengths and where we spend our time and energy. But it's, um, these aren't beliefs. I mean, they're findings. Yes, right, right, It's not, right. it's less a philosophy. It's more like, the f- you've got three daughters. Could they be any more different? Sure, very different, yes. And your hopes and dreams for each one are seen through that difference. And the DNA, if we went down to the level of DNA, each one of your kids has a totally different uh, network of synaptic connections in her brain. So that's a finding. That, and by the way, we know that her brain will grow. Each one of your daughter's brains will grow most in the areas where they already have the most, that you grow the most synaptic connections, where you have the most existing synaptic connections. So 
So the growth through life isn't becoming someone else. It's becoming, in a sense, more and more of who you already are. Hopefully a more intelligent version of who you already are. <laughs> sure, sure. But that's a finding, not a philosophy. That's a fanning, yeah. That's, I appreciate that clarity. What's one habit that's improved your life? One of them is I do an exercise routine called Legree. Okay. L-A-G-R-E-E, which is like Pilates, but it's on a, a bed that sort of moves. And it's 25 minutes. And I've always been sort of into exercise, but you do every single activity really, really, really slowly. Oh, I've been on one of these. It's so hard. Oh my gosh. It's so it, hard, man. It forces yes, I you know to what you're talking about. Strength, but it also forces you to slow down. It's sort of like yoga, but it's yoga with slow twitch muscle fiber growth. And it's so weird, <laughs> but it's, it's like an addiction because it forces you to slow everything down. No, I hear you. I, a buddy of mine goes every single day and I don't go as often as him. I'm a yoga person, but... He always says, well, I go all the time because the more I go, it's not as insanely painful if I don't miss days. So you may be the same way. Yeah, completely. Yeah, it's like if you do miss a few days, you come back and your little legs start shaking like a son of a gun. And it's fun. The body's a funny thing. It, it loves to get into routines that it can feel at home with. But I, I like the slowing down too, though. The whole kind of Gosh, we run so fast, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. One last question, Marcus. You know, the show is called Game Changers. So, so what Game Changer has inspired you in your life and why? The person that has always inspired me is Donald O. Clifton, who is the chairman of the Gallup organization. He's who I wrote Now Discover Your Strengths With and built Strength Finder with way back when. Um, and the way that he, two things. One, he's a scientist. So the way in which he approached what do we know about the world was just very rigorous. He never made anything up. It was all very careful and rigorous and methodologically sound. And I just, I just loved the simplicity of that and the humility of that. And then second, um, he was completely himself. There was, there was, he never really tried to get anyone to like him or he just was himself. And you knew exactly who he was, and he was unapologetic about it. He was a, he was a nice enough man, but he was, he was quiet. He was thoughtful. He wouldn't fill a silence. So there would be sometimes in conversation these really awkward, long pauses. But he was always that, and just diligently went about his business of building the Gallup organization in a way that was based on rigor and humility. And I... Whenever I lose my way, I think about him and what he would do. Marcus, thank you for all of this. I'm so excited for your new book. I certainly loved it. And I know this uh, content is incredibly powerful for so many of the people listening. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.